Hey there and welcome, my name is Carlos Berlis and let's start talking about what has been going on in the indie tabletop RPG scene. And as always, I'm not being directly sponsored by anyone mentioned here unless explicitly said or mentioned otherwise. Some links may be affiliate links so that they can help me a little bit without costing you anything extra and all the links will be in the description together with some timestamps so that you can jump to the point of your preference. Also today we have an interview with Chris Bissett from Luther Room and the creator of, among others, Go Alone, The Wretched and a lot of content for other games as well. So today we start with a release from RPG Latam, the Latin American tabletop RPG scene. Cordelia Needs a Kingdom by Armanda. This solo journaling game can also be played in group if you so prefer and is about childhood and exploration. And in this game you are a child exploring a forest and this exploration uses a solitaire grid with some traditional playing cards to shape the game and the story. And it has a very light tone which is described by the creator themselves as naive, innocent and wholesome. And we all know that we need this kind of energy sometimes in our days, weeks, lives, pandemics, what is time actually. We need sometimes this kind of energy. And another release, this time inspired by Latin American stories, is Hear Her Weep. And this fast-paced card game is inspired by the stories of La Llorona. This fast-paced card game is currently being uh, offered as part of a bundle with 50% off, so you can get it with some kind of discount as well. On crowdfunding, this week I bring to your attention Ecopunk 2044 by Dice Capital. It's not capital, it's capital with a K. The game puts you on the midst of a war that, much like our own, has its ecology collapsing. In the game, you can't stop it, you can't stop the ecology collapse, but you can try and slow it down. Kind of what we are trying to do. Okay, yeah. Moving on. You have the plain text version already available on itch.io so you can really see what the game brings to the table and the art for it is looking amazing so i really hope that it funds because then we will have this art by so many great and interesting artists and creators and it's a classless system with an interesting mechanic uh, that talks about hacking not hacking games hacking the system, hack the planet, you know it. And it also has a dice pool system, which for me is always interesting, much more than some traditional other systems. And you have still some 20 odd days to back it and help this project reach all its potential with the fully diagrammed, layouted and fully art version. And World Champ Games released Four Schools, a game that plays with six-sided dice and stickers. In it, you play as warriors that are brave or foolish enough to go on a dangerous journey to traverse a uh, wasteland and try to bring some gods back to life. If this is your jam. Sometimes it might be hard to navigate the world of commissions and all that. We... or some of you may know that because you are artists and it can be even tougher for the artist that is being commissioned. So JN Butler made available a commission contract template to try and help you on, and that can anyone use it to be the starting point to your particular contract. It was not made by a lawyer by any case and it's not legal advice just so you know it, but as I said, it, it is a starting point so that you have some details and some instructions on how to use it and all the jazz that you can then try and craft a better contract to your particular needs. So if you are an artist thinking about offering some commissions and you are not well versed on this world of contracts and all that, I'd encourage you to give it at least a look and having a contract in place can be or should be your go-to from the beginning because it can be terribly helpful and can save you a lot of trouble on the future. Okay, on articles, 
and threads. This time we have a thread by Clayton Notestein and like all his threads, this visual design thread uh, brings some ideas about logos. So it's top notch. Like any kind of visual design thread that you can expect from Clayton, he explores or some tabletop RPGs, logos, uh, some brands uh, or some games particularly, and why he appreciates them while also giving some very useful information and pointers if you are trying to design your own logo for your game, for your brand, and all that jazz. I really think that you should give it a look, and if not, just get inspired by the logo and the good study that he makes of it. And without further ado, we are heading to the interview with Chris Bissett. So, as mentioned, we are here with Chris Bissett from Luther Room, and we'll be talking about his way into creating games uh, and his way into going into the indie scene. So, Mostly, we are aware that, uh, Chris, you started making titles for other games, I do believe with 5e and Gems Guild, and then you transitioned into making your own game. So how was this experience of, of transitioning for, from making content for other games and then going for your own games? It wasn't as hard as it possibly could have been to be honest because I took a year off from doing anything before I started making my own games so I was doing DMs Guild for two or three years and then I took a year off completely from doing anything because I was just too busy with things um, and then when I started making things again I just didn't really I didn't really care about D&D anymore <laughs> so um, I wanted to make something I just I just jumped into making my own stuff I've, I've actually started making content for other games again a little bit now after spending a year of making just my own stuff um but the actual transition was really easy because i spent a year just playing games um and so it was a really natural progression to just start writing things yeah i believe that since you started like since anyone started playing other games it's it starts motivating you on trying oh yeah i like this part of this game this part of another game this part of another one perhaps i can try and make something that will work out all these things together so seems like a a, a smooth transition from from then on yeah, and exactly. uh sorry yeah that's agreeing with you <laughs> <laughs> and uh what was the first game that you published since you started making like your own games um the first game was a really small game called freelance for two players um that was just a game about arguing about trying to get paid um because i was doing some freelance writing for a D, &D thing and couldn't get paid <laughs> 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 um, but the first big game that i did uh, when i started was under the floorboards which i did for zine quest in 2020 was it 2020 yeah zine quest 2020 oh he's got it on the shelf yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was the first big game um and then the, the next one after that was the wretched and then it just kind of took off from there yeah from from the wretched like you at first published it without kickstarter or or a, a small run and then yeah. it blew out of proportions with the srd and uh <laughs> yeah it was mad i um i only did i did the wretched um while under the floorboards was kickstarting um because i wanted to, i had never printed a product before and so i wanted to test out like how to print a book and how to post a book to people and so i wrote the wretched um in a day or two days at work and then um I, yeah i published 25 copies of it and they sold out within five minutes because i think I don't know, I guess I marketed it well. <laughs> People saw the artwork on Twitter and really liked it. Um, and then, yeah, I did, Matt did the, um, the SRD and we did the jam. And then I did that Kickstarter for the big print run. And it's, it's just kind of got bigger and bigger since then. It's been amazing. It's been life-changing, honestly. Yeah, uh, one other thing that I, I think that was uh, important with the Ratchet is that it kind of 
brought to the forefront the idea of solo games and journaling games because at the moment we were kind of trying to isolate so playing some games was not easy and then uh with the ratchet you you came uh i mean not that you created the idea of solo journaling games but you came with the the idea of making it a solo journaling game and uh i guess that that it vibed with people yeah it's like so it's one of those things where i was playing a lot of solo journaling games anyway like i've been playing um thousand year old vampire I've been playing uh, James Chips, The Adventurer. Um, I think I think I was playing Kiena's um, Before the Tower Falls at that point. I can't remember the timeline exactly. But yeah, and I was playing solo Iron Sworn as well. So like, because I was, I was going into work, like the UK was in lockdown. I was going into an office with five other people who were sitting 20 feet away from me and not talking to anyone and had no work to do, but I had to keep going into the office anyway um so i was just sitting playing solo games all day so when i decided i was going to write another game it kind of made sense to write a solo game and i had i'd already decided i wanted to write a jenga game because i'd written one before called um escape uh, exit pursued by a bear which is like a jenga party game where you all tell stories about being attacked by a bear and then play jenga <laughs> and i kind of had it in my head that i wanted to do a jenga trilogy um, so I did, I did a second Jenga game, which was the wretched. And then that just kind of dictated the rest of my career <laughs> for the next year. Yeah. Because then with the jam and everything, uh, it, I, it just took off and then you had the Kickstarter for, for wretched we, that you even made like, uh, LPs for, for the soundtrack because yeah. it, it was not the first soundtrack was the wretched, the first soundtrack that you made for a game um it was the first soundtrack i made for a game i'd been doing before i kind of relaunched my patreon as um making monthly games i was doing it to as had the patreon running for posts on loot the room like just to fund loot the room as a site and when i tried to get it going again after taking a year off i um i had this like post model that i was going to do where every month i was going to release like a map and then some adventure hooks and then some treasure and then a soundtrack to go with that map so i'd done a few bits of ambient music for playing D, &D but nothing as long as um the wretched soundtrack and i just kind of i want to try and do soundtrack a lot more soundtracks and hopefully now that i'm going full time i'll have the time to do it because it takes so much time to do <laughs> Yeah, I, I actually I love the the Ratchet soundtrack. Sometimes sometimes I use it like just as a background while doing anything creative because then I can write. Usually, when songs have lyrics, I cannot concentrate on writing. <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah. having uh, the Ratchet and actually from Go Alone is another one that I just love. It changes a little I bit. Think the, you're, the you're the person who mentions the Go Alone soundtrack the most. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it's a sign that I really enjoy it. <laughs> you and you and Spencer Campbell both really like that game, and that makes me happy. And uh, yeah, Go Alone was another one using the same idea, the same SRD from from the Ratchet. And did it release it during the jam? I do believe so. Yeah, that was my game for the Ratchet and Alone jam. Um, that was my third Ratchet and Alone game because I did Discovery of Witch, Wonderful Discovery of Witches during the wretched kickstarter and then i did go alone third i can't remember if i've done another one. Oh, i did the assassin for patreon as well my assassin's creed one yeah yeah and uh, actually i do believe that also the srd got some updates or some ideas from because some people brought the attention of sometimes jenga tower was not the most uh, accessible and everything yeah i think matt's been maintaining it i am um... People always give me the credit for the SRD and it wasn't me. It was Matt Sanders um, of Sealed Library because he wanted to do... Like, we talk every day and we show each other works in progress and stuff that we're working on all the time. So when I showed him The Wretched, he was like, oh, shit, I've got a game about a librarian that I've been trying to write for ages. Can I use this system? And I was like, yeah, of course you can. But aren't you um, Matt and the same person? Well, aren't we? <laughs> I don't see him here. <laughs> um and so he was like in he writes games kind of 
he interacts with systems differently to me kind of mentally and so i think in order to write the sealed library he kind of broke the wretched apart into its pieces to see how it was working so that he could write a game for it and then he was like well i've basically written an srd why don't we do a game jam why don't we publish an srd and i just said yeah sure why not um so matt gets the credit for that that was all the jam was matt's idea the srd was matt's idea um sending a copy to show up and sit down was matt's idea so very grateful to that guy who i is definitely not me and uh from then now you you mentioned that you started with your patron again you have like monthly games kind of uh, uh i I do believe that you mentioned early, earlier or like recently that uh, now you are perhaps going games and some titles for other games as well. Uh, but uh... yeah, um, I really like writing adventures um, and like content for other games. Um, and I also, I like writing systems and I like writing new games and obviously other people do because people release new games every single day. But um, nobody ever supports the games, or very rarely do people like people won't release a will release a game and then like just not release anything else for it. Like me with um, under the floorboards, I've never released anything extra for it. I've never released anything extra for the hunted. Um, and I think something that's really important is to support games with additional content. And if you look at the big games like D&D and Pathfinder and the big trad games, that's their model, right? They, you know, they put out a game and then they support it with content. Um, and so I wanted to, A, I wanted to write content for games because I like writing adventures and B, I wanted to, I don't know. I don't know how to, how to say what yeah. I'm trying to say, but yeah, I'm, I'm I would say between writing games and writing content. Yeah. Supporting games, like making, because by supporting games you keep them uh, for longer on on the view of people and also they provide tools for people that really enjoy the game to try and enjoy it differently and for a longer time because there are only as much that we can come out with our own i would say so it's nice to have like sometimes some seeds uh, even that the, if the person does not use exactly what you put for the game it can form something that they can then create their own thing on, yeah. on top of that. And like, sometimes you have an idea that you want to write and like, it's, it's not a game. It doesn't need to be a game. Like the, I did um, in September, no wait, August, I did um, Feast, which is just a, an adventure for like OSR dungeon games. There's no need for that to be a game on its own. So I just made it not a game. It's just <laughs> a, you know, it's just a module. Yeah, uh, uh, like and like your future project, I, I did not know if it will be your next project, but the Solo Troika adventure is also something that, is that there is no need to like create a whole game. I will create say, content for for another one. Yeah, that's that's in a weird middle space that one because that's a um. Do you know the I don't like the old. The fighting fantasy books that Steve Jackson games and Steve Jackson and Ian Livingstone did. Yeah, I do not know the precise games, but I uh, but I played some similar ones in Portuguese uh, when I was younger. <laughs> yeah, so it occupies this weird middle space because Troika is based on advanced fighting fantasy, and advanced fighting fantasy took the system from the solo fighting fantasy books and turned it into sort of like a D&D style thing that you could play with your friends and then Troika took that and modernized it and then I'm taking Troika and turning it back into a solo game book um so it it is content for Troika but for one player but then you could take the Troika rules like like Advanced Fighting Fantasy did with Dungeoneer you could take the book and run it as a module for Troika if you wanted to yeah, it's so it's it, it sits in a weird space as well. I don't know how well it's going to do. Yeah, I mean that that is the the magic of the indie scene. Like <laughs> you can yeah. try and do <laughs> this kind of middle things, and uh, hopefully people will enjoy. It, actually, hopefully, I mean it, it makes sense to me because I grew up with fighting fantasy and advanced fighting fantasy was my first like 
dungeon game before D and D. Um, so well, about the same time as I started playing D and D, I was also playing Advanced Fighting Fantasy, um, and it just made sense to me to take Troika and, and turn it back into a fighting fantasy book. Yeah, actually, some other uh, some some friends from Brazil they they love playing solo games, so th this will probably hit uh, on on their mark as well. <laughs> Uh, we so. are usually uh, exchanging experiences and journals from trying and playing different solo games because, yeah, pandemic. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting to see. Uh, uh, actually, I am curious to see what will, it will come out of it. And also, recently, you just uh, finished fulfilling your Kickstarter for Markborg as well. Yes. Troll, Treasures of the Troll King. God, that fulfillment process took forever. <laughs> <laughs> I um, If I ever have a Kickstarter, I'll do that well again. I'm saying this. I say if I ever have a Kickstarter, I'll do that well again. I'll pay someone to do fulfillment, but I know I won't. I know that I'll just end up doing it myself again. Um, but yeah, that's, that was really good. That's If I ever have a Kickstarter that successful again, I'll be very surprised. That did really well. Um, and I'm really grateful for that because that's, again, that's like one of those life-changing events. So that's been really good. Yeah, it, it is nice to see Kickstarter, one of the few projects in Kickstarter that actually changed someone's life instead of just being completely yeah. big Between brands. And the record, <laughs> like it's been, it's been a, it's been a weird year. <laughs> and uh, so did you expect that uh, Morkborg, the, that uh, Treasures of the Troll King, would be that big? I mean, Morkborg is uh, is popular in a way, but uh... I knew it would fund. Like, I had no doubt about it funding. Um, I didn't know it would fund the way it did. I didn't know it. Would... I think if I'd run that for another week, it would have kept going at the same pace. Um, yeah, it's been crazy, but it's it's one of those products, one of those books that keeps selling. Like people keep buying it after the Kickstarter as well, which is that's the dream, really. Like you don't, I don't want to rely on Kickstarter. I don't think the industry should have to rely on Kickstarter. And so, getting those releases that do continue to sell steadily and give you like regular income, I think, is really important. And I've managed to do that with Treasures of the Troll King and the Wretched. Um, I've been really, really kind of fortunate with that. So, um, yeah, I don't know what my point is. <laughs> yeah, actually hitting that passive income that uh, like keeps keeps coming back uh, because, as you mentioned, sometimes you 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 have a you have a game or anyone releases it, it sells really well on the beginning, but without support, without extra materials, sometimes it just dies out so it's nice when you have uh, something that you can that you publish it and it it keeps coming back yeah and since we are talking about uh, creating anything like how or what would you say that uh, would be your style or what inspires you for okay this is the kind of title or the kind of game that i want to write right now god i, I don't know how to answer that question um because I write, if there's, if there's one thing I'll say for me, it's that I've got range. I write basically anything. Like I've gone from Feast last month to the game that I part yesterday, um, The Fiction We Live, which is like a very quiet, um, introspective game about like friends getting back together after a long time and having conversations about the past. Um, it's, I just kind of, focus on whatever has my attention at any one time i think it's maybe it's an adhd thing where i just like i don't know i don't have any one thing that i like to write i like writing horror and i like writing kind of weird horror adventures but it's not it's not just that it's not just that yeah, yeah. um that's and actually, easy to write <laughs> and actually you came from like your background is in literature right yeah, I was a fiction writer for years. I was trying to break into short fiction and trying to write novels for years and years and years. And like, I went to uni to learn, like, my degree is in creative writing and my master's is in creative writing. Um, and then I just fell into games. 
and apparently <laughs> games worked in a way that fiction never did. I still want to write novels um, at some point. Maybe now that I'm going full time, I'll have the time to actually do that as well as writing games. We'll see. But yeah, yeah. like I've tried loads of things. I've tried to do screenwriting. I've done, I've done all sorts of shit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we are happy that we, you finish it like uh, or finish it not but you ended up uh, going into the 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 game creative space so <laughs> yeah i'm happy it's been fun i really enjoy it it's um it's one of those things where when you start once you start writing games and adventures every idea you have you're like how can i turn that into a game um so like i'll even even when i have ideas for short stories or novels now i'm like yeah but could it be a game instead And I need to break out of that if I want to go back to writing fiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and actually, I do believe that you were also uh, kind of an an inspiration for a lot of people to start creating games and starting creating titles. Uh, I saw recently a lot of people mentioning that uh, you inspired them on really trying out. So how do you feel uh, that you are now someone that actually inspired people to also start creating their own games? I don't think about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I try not to acknowledge that. It's really like, it's amazing when people tell me that, but it doesn't feel real. Because um, as far as I'm concerned, I'm still like just some person trying to make games. Like I'm still, as far as I'm concerned, I'm still starting out and like just trying to figure it all out. So it's weird for someone to say, oh, you inspired me to make games. And it's great to hear that, but I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I do believe it. People aren't lying when they say it, um, but it's very strange because you only ever see, like, you can't ever see yourself from the outside, can you? So you don't know how other people see you. And, like, I don't know. All I see when I release games and stuff is, like, the chaos in my head. Mm. I don't see what it looks like from the outside. Um, so my, I think my perception of myself and my perception of my what stage of my career I'm at is very different to the perception that other people have, I think. Mm. Um But yeah, it's, it's really amazing to hear that. Um, and I hope that that continues. Like, that's that's all I want is I want to encourage more people to write and to make games and to do stuff because it's fun and everyone should do it. <laughs> it it's, you know, the more, the more diverse a group of people we have making games, the more interesting games we're going to get. Um, the, it's a win-win for everyone. Yeah, uh, th that is something that I think that is very important from the indie scene is is that you have like a very diverse background of people trying to create games and then informing other people's games as well. Because, okay, so you, as you, we mentioned, okay, you read someone's game, you like something and then you, oh yeah, that would perhaps fit well on my idea that I had and so on. And you can then have better titles in the end actually because yeah absolutely because you get all this this creative juice going on <laughs> yeah like all games are art and all art is a conversation with itself with the other art that's happening around it with the world and the more the more diversity of voices you have in a conversation the more interesting a conversation you're going to have Yeah, that makes total sense, actually. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, actually, now that you are going uh, full time, uh, what are your expectations? Because this is something that it was really long in the making. Uh, we, we, myself, actually, I followed a little bit of that uh, from Twitter, like that you were trying to go if things went well and then now we were finally giving the last steps into transitioning into full time yeah and i, I imagine one. that it's surreal it's surreal and it's scary and it doesn't quite feel real yet um like i've been working since i was 14 and i'm 35 now um the longest i've ever not had like a job with an actual like income where someone else was paying me has been a month in 21 years um and in three weeks time i'm not going to have a salary anymore and all my money is going to come from games and that's really scary um but i think i can make it work i've got plans for stuff i want to do i'm going to sit down um 
I've got a week between finishing my job and the Kickstarter starting. Um, and I'm going to sit down and like plan out what a day looks like and what a week of work looks like. And because I think it's really important to treat it like a job because it is a job. Um, and I'm going to budget very carefully and I'm not going to spend a grand and a half on Zine Quest again. <laughs> <laughs> Um, like for the last for the last year since the wretched came out really i've effectively had two incomes because games has been going really well for me and that's given me that's allowed me to get myself in a position where i can say i don't need the salary of my day job anymore um and yeah hopefully money's going to be tight it's going to be tough but having all that extra time to work on it and treat it like a business instead of doing it in the evenings when I'm exhausted from the job, I think it's just going to make it yeah, so much easier. Actually, uh, like it, it frees some spoons that you can use them on games and not just like in stress of commuting and being in the office yeah. and all of that. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think it's going to take some time to, it's going to take some time to adjust, definitely. Um, and it's going to be a few months before I like, hit my stride properly because obviously like I'm moving house at the same time and etc. Um but yeah it's gonna be really good. I'm really I'm really excited for it. It hasn't sunk in yet. It doesn't feel real yet. Yeah and actually uh since no, it's a little bit tied up with that that uh Luther Room you actually started also publishing more articles back on, on yeah. that again. So uh I do not know that uh, if most people know that you have Luther Room as a blog as well because they know your games, but perhaps they do not know the other part. Yeah, the blog runs in cycles. Um, like Luther Room started as a blog, um, started as a blog, and then I started writing little things for the DMs Guild, and then the blog just kind of. I I was doing maps rather than like blog posts, and like I'm not an artist. I enjoy doing maps. I got quite good at them but um, I'm a writer and yeah, the blog just goes in cycles every few months. I'm like, I'm going to write some blog posts and I do a few posts and then other things take precedence and then it falls away for six months again. And then I write some more. Um, and to be honest, I think I'll just keep it that way. Like it's nice to have it for when I've got something I want to write that isn't a game or an adventure or, you know, it's just, it's a place I can put things Um You can have a conversation with yourself on a, yeah. on a written basis, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a nice place to just dump ideas um, that isn't Twitter. Because <laughs> <laughs> A, it's permanent in a way that Twitter isn't. And B, people don't get as angry about ideas that are on blog posts as they do about ideas that are in tweets. Yeah. <laughs> Mainly because people don't read blog posts. Yeah, and I'll, uh, and different from games, you do not have to do layout and all of that. <laughs> exactly. You can just dump it on the blog. Because you do your own layouts as well. Yeah, I um, I do everything pretty much. Um, part of that was a f part of the reason for that was just that I was when I started out I was very poor, so I couldn't pay people to do things for me, and I wanted my stuff to look good. Um, and so I just taught myself to do things. And I think I was I was partly responsible for starting that arms race on DMs Guild of making stuff look better and better and better. Because when I started out, most people were using like the DMs Guild template that they give you that's just a Word document and like they weren't really doing fancy covers and stuff. And I came along and was like, I'm going to make my shit look good and I'm going to do it cheap. Um, and then, I mean, I'm not saying that I started that, but I was one of the people involved in Yeah, I, I even remember stuff. your uh, little room blog post about uh, doing layout and uh, or actually creating an adventure and mention layout. It was, yeah. I do believe that it was the first thing that I read about layout when I tried to make games. So, oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, that was when I did uh, Breaker of Chains, yeah. um, which I still think it's not an amazing adventure, but I still like it a lot. Um, it, I'll never be able to do anything else with it because Wizards of the Coast own it because it's on the DMs Guild, but whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. And yeah, that was even back then, I was like, I want to encourage people to get into it. And like the barriers that traditionally exist to publishing aren't actually barriers. Um, 
I mean, obviously, time is a factor. Money is a factor. You know, not anybody can learn to do this stuff if they've got the time and the resources to learn to do it, you know. Um, it's not as easy as saying everybody can do it. Everybody yeah. can in an ideal world. Yeah, but uh, it, it, even though like it's not like uh, oh, everyone can do it and it's as easy as that, it's at least important to say to people, you can do it if you have the time and you want it, you can try and learn it. It's not like something magical or something that you need. It's yeah. not like a hidden talent or that you need to go to university to learn it. No, you can learn it. That's you... it yeah. The barrier is the barrier is time and being able to get hold, get the tools, you know. So the barrier is time and money, not um it's the same in like it's the same in the music industry. Like there's this big um mystique around mastering specifically. Like people mix their music and then they send it off for mastering. They don't know what master engineers do and it comes back sounding great and they pay a fortune for it and anyone can do it you just it's you need the time and you need the the tools yeah. um and yeah I'm, i'm a big proponent of um demystifying things um and i think one of the reasons we're seeing such a boom in games the past five six years is you know it's a combination of cheaper tools easier access to tools and easier access to information in the form of like YouTube and, you know, the internet. Like when I started making stuff in the nineties and the late noughties, didn't really have access to that information. And it was very much like making zines by hand, photocopying them, stapling them together. They were like shit, um, which I still love. I love a handmade zine. I love a like, you know, I grew up in like punk circles and stuff as well. And like handmade fanzines are absolutely a part of that culture. And I love them. Um, But people still want things to, to, to look good. Like it's yeah. nice. It's interesting, but I do get that. Not everyone, like some people want that indie content looking as a triple A <laughs> something. And that is some that we are getting to a part where we can now uh, provide that. Like, yeah. And yeah. like part of it is a, again a time and resources thing like i could make a cut out zine that i went and photocopy you know glue everything down and go and photocopy it and print it and hand assemble it it takes four times as long as throwing something into indesign and printing it with mixum yeah. so like why why would i do that if i'm strapped for time yeah like there's, there's this kind of irony that um the handmade cheaply put together zine aesthetic actually sometimes excludes people because if you're working two jobs and looking after a kid and don't have any money then you don't have the time to put together a cutout zine yeah even though it looks like diy and cheap and easy to make it may be not as easy as just typing something up on your laptop and hitting print yeah i don't know someone's probably going to take issue with me saying that but get fucked <laughs> actually it, it's an opinion and opinions are protected yeah. <laughs> opinions are allowed to be wrong it's fine <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh, uh i really like the 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 way that the in, actually as you mentioned we are trying to demystify some some stuff and that is something that i think was really important in bringing so many different people trying and, and make their games because they see that it's possible. And mm -hmm. uh, with, with that, you see yourself, like you see someone that has a regular job and still is creating content, is creating games. They are looking good. And uh, they th they perhaps start questioning if they can do that, that themselves as well. Yeah. And it's it's breaking down the barrier of like, access to people as well like um one of the guys that made um a game for the wretched jam um adam boys i think he made the first two games that were published in the jam and they were the first games he'd ever made uh he'd never made board games before board games rpgs before that's my partner waving at me before <laughs> she goes out for a run <laughs> um he'd never made a game before and so 
he came and did the Ratchet Jam and made two games, and then he made a game with Spencer Campbell. And I don't know how they ended up talking. But, you know, Spencer's like a pretty big deal. Spencer's won um what he won best rules at like the Indicades or Indie Game of the Year awards or something like that. Yeah. He's been nominated for like four Ennies, you know. He's yeah. had a few really successful Kickstarters. Like Spencer was here a in big deal. A, a previous interview. <laughs> yeah. He's a really, <laughs> really nice guy. Um, and like Boise got to work with him on a game. And like, I'm not saying that Matt and I for running the jam were responsible for that, but that kind of ethos, like the jam atmosphere on itch, and like the I, I don't like to say the word community because we're not community, but the the space on Twitter yeah, breaks down those barriers. Perhaps. Yeah, the scene. People, you have access to people that you wouldn't necessarily have access to. You know. Like, yeah, I I, I, I love that it broke that uh, idea of you need to go to convention and then go drinking in the bar afterwards to yeah. make content uh, co contact. This was just <laughs> exactly like you know a decade ago, maybe fifteen years ago, if Mokborg had come out. I would have seen it advertised in a magazine. I would have gone to a shop. I would have bought it. I would have played it. And that would have been it. I wouldn't have got to know Johan through Twitter. I wouldn't have got to work with Johan. You know, um, I don't, I, we don't talk often enough for me to say he's a friend, but we're friendly. Yep. You know, um, he's a really nice guy who I get on with and I'm hopefully going to work with him again. That wouldn't be possible without Twitter and without the, the scene that exists yeah, um, yeah the, the whole yeah. ecosystem that is being brought uh, around that uh, yeah i believe that it's it's something that is really important we are yeah. hitting close to our 30 minutes mark uh <laughs> so uh do you have anything extra like you mentioned that one week you have three weeks and two start going full time one week after that it will be the kickstarter so in, in four theory, weeks time yeah. Yes, I'm hoping to launch it on the 1st of November. It's going to run for a month. Um, it's going to have the biggest Kickstarter goal I've ever set, which is going to be somewhere between five and eight thousand pounds, I think. Um, because this time, like, I'm paying for editing and I'm paying for art, and it's a big book that needs printing. Mm. Um, but yeah, I'm hopefully launch on the 1st of November. I will have a preview before that. Um, that's with Jared for editing right now. So when mm. the second Jared gets that back to me and I can get it into the layout, <laughs> um, I'm going to release that and be like, here, this is what it is. Go look at it and play it. And then if you want to back it, please throw some money at me in November. <laughs> <laughs> and when can we expect uh, the second D36? Oh, God, I don't know. <laughs> um, that was meant to be out in like August. I've how many people i'm waiting for work from four people um project management is one of those skills that i'm not good at um and obviously i don't want uh, to change marketing again. writing layouting uh so yeah. there is something that you everything. need not do well <laughs> yeah i didn't do well at the project management um i need to give everyone another nudge and say hey have you got something for me it might be a case of having to just publish it without those last few pieces we'll see um but you know obviously we're still in a pandemic people yeah. are still super stressed i don't want to be breathing down people's necks and saying no you owe me work you know so um d36 issue two is coming d36 issue three is coming i don't know when yeah they will come when want, they are ready. Basically. Yeah, I want to get D36 issue one out before the end of the year. Whether that happens or not, we're in October now. I don't know. You mean um, issue two? Issue two. I'm, okay. I meant issue two. D36 <laughs> issue two. And yeah, like Dice Souls has to happen before the end of the year as well. So it's going to be a busy three months. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, at least you have uh, some busy time going full time. So <laughs> yeah. That's it. I have the time for it now, so that's good. Yeah. So uh, I am very happy that you were available, that uh, you took your time to talk with me. Um, and I hope that uh, the Kickstarter goes well and that your transition to full-time goes as good as you can hope. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you very you. much for that, uh, Chris. No, thanks for having me. It's been fun. Yeah. See you. 
for today. I believe that's it. If you like the video, like the damn video, share, subscribe, you know how internet works. Let me know in the comments what you liked about today's video, what you disliked about it, what you are liking about the series, disliking, everything like that. You can pay me a coffee on coffee. you can buy my games on itch.io, and I will see you all in my next video. So, see ya!